Hi, I'm Ellen Madison, a trustee at the Babcock Smith House Museum. And I'm Linda Chafee, also a trustee at the Babcock Smith House Museum. Part of our mission at the Babcock Smith House is to document and preserve the history of the granite industry. So we were really pleased to be asked by the Westerly Library and Wilcox Park to uh, present this program on the uh, history of the Columbus statue. The focus of this um, presentation is on the granite industry itself and what it took to make these monuments and also the community heritage that it, that it represents. By 1899, Westerly was famous for its granite industry. And you can see on this map that we have documented Westerly granite in 41 of the 48 contiguous states. And when you think about the fact that the, the bulk of the granite production here in Westerly had ended by about 1920 or so, this is an amazing feat to think about all this granite shipped to all of these different states and erected there. And we have had volunteers from the museum tra travel all over the country taking pictures of monuments. We have over 2,200 monuments that we have photographed in these uh, 41 states. We aren't going to give you the history of the granite industry in Westerly, but rather begin in the 1890s. By that time, that granite foundation had been laid and the industry itself ex uh, involved so many different skilled artisans. Here we've got a photograph of the quarry workers, carvers, well, we don't have photographs of them all on this slide, but quarry workers and carvers and letter cutters and statue cutters and blacksmiths and oxen drivers and people who made leather aprons. And all of these people were contributing to the um, industry. By 1900, the, oh, go ahead. And the fame of this industry traveled far and wide and it began to draw immigrants from Italy who had worked in the stone industry in Italy, but thought if they came to this country, they might have uh, better opportunities for employment and uh, advancement. And as a matter of fact, by 1900, statistics show that 57% of the people in Westerly were indirectly or directly involved with the granite industry. 4,000 people out of a total of 7,000 in Westerly were employed in those jobs. And um, Linda always teases me that I was a Dunn's Corners kid, but she was a downtown kid. So I'm going to let her orient you to where this photograph was taken. Well, this is in front of the post office. It's really neat because we have cars and horse and buggy and it's um, just a little after 1900. And this is the town that we're talking about as being this hub of granite production. So when did the Italians come in? We know that there were Finns and Irish and Scots and, all, and Yankees involved in this industry. But um, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, by the 18, in the 1880s, there was an influx of immigrants from Northern Italy, followed in the early 1900s by a second wave, this time from Southern Italy. And there began to be um, real stirrings of pride as these people contributed to the granite industry here in town. Some of them came directly to Westerly to work. Some uh, went to school in New York City to learn various trades associated with carving and, and um, stone stonework. Um, and others came and went to another town maybe where there were granite quarries and then came to Westerly. But there was always this sense of pride in the Italian community of uh, people who wanted to um, celebrate both their heritage and the skill. We, we have to blend these both when we're talking about Columbus. 
both the, the Italian heritage and the skill that was involved in producing the monuments that came out of Westerly. It was at this time that this vague idea of some sort of monument uh, to those two things was stirring in the Italian community. So we've, we have found sources that said it was 1890, and then we found sources that said uh, 1899. So somewhere in that decade, the, the idea of a monument was born. And it wasn't until Chris Emanuel went to Italy on a trip to see the sculptures. He was really excited about seeing the various sculptures. And in Genoa, Italy, he saw the statue of Columbus and he got all excited. In fact, he's quoted as saying, as you can see on this slide, there he was inspired by the pulchritude and splendor of a statue of Christopher Columbus surrounded by its broad depth of beautiful flowers. And that broad depth of beautiful flowers led him to say, well, whatever statue or whatever we do in Westerly has to be in a park-like setting. And fortunately, we had Wilcox Park. So when he came back in 1933, started talking about this idea, really beginning to um, talk it up. And in 1939, six years later, a committee was established and serious fundraising began. Next On the slide. next slide, you'll see yep. a list of the people that we have been able to document that were on the committee to uh, get the monument erected. And uh, just look at the names. I mean, it's a, a collection of Italian Americans from Westerly. As a school teacher here in Westerly, having called the roll call in many study halls, all the names seem very familiar to me. But lots and lots of people worked hard to make this happen. Linda and I teased each other. Not one of us has a drop of Italian blood in us, so we are not going to pronounce these names for you. But if you look carefully, maybe you can find somebody in your family or someone whose grandchildren you know now uh, who were on this committee. And there were people here who owned quarries, who owned sheds, uh, who worked in the granite industry, as well as influential people like the two Dr. Ruisis in town. So it was, it was a nice mix of influential Italians. The quote at the bottom is from Arthur Cottrell, who was president of the town council at the time of the dedication. And I think what he said was very meaningful. This memorial statue was made possible by the painstaking efforts of many of our citizens. And fundraising was difficult at this time. You know, this was just after the depression. It was before World War II. It was going to take a lot of, um, a lot of effort to, to round out some plans and to raise some money. Various Italo-American clubs and organizations joined forces with individuals to raise the money. And finally, by 1948, Next slide. The contract was awarded to the Joseph Kaduri Granite Company um, to build uh, this statue. Don't think we made a mistake. We make mistakes, but this is not a mistake to have the printing so that you can't read it here. This shed was off Oak Street and the Kaduri Granite Company was um, very clever in doing a lot of advertising. So, this uh, name on the top of the building is meant to be read by people going by on the train and seeing that Westerly was very well noted for its granite industry. The picture is taken, the photograph is taken from Oak Street and um, this was a very thriving shed at this point. The contract was awarded for $14,000. And in today's money, that's about $154,000. That's a lot of money to be raised in the town of Westerly for a, a statue. That is, um, it's, it's just amazing. The next slide shows the Kaduri gang. And this photograph was taken in 1924, 25, somewhere in that time period. So it's earlier than the time we're talking about, but we chose this 
so that you could see the the uh, number of people involved in in this industry. These are the people that just worked here, and you can see how how many there are. Richard Kaduri was the owner when the contract was awarded, and he was also a member of the original committee um, to work on this Columbus statue. And now, Linda will tell you all about the statue. The monument is a truly impressive monument. It stands 15 feet tall from the base to the top of the statue. The statue itself, Columbus himself is seven feet tall, he's heroic size. And the bases and the die are eight feet tall. When we were doing our research on this, we had to um, read lots of old newspaper articles. And thank goodness, the wonderful librarians at the Westerly Public Library for years clipped out newspaper articles and filed them by subject. So when we wanted to do something on Columbus, we went to a folder that said Columbus, and there was a whole collection of old newspaper articles that provided our uh, sources for this PowerPoint. And when we wrote our book, we said that it was made out of red and blue. But the more we researched, and there's a discrepancy in the various sources. So, you know, we have to, we're giving you our best guess at what the truth is. And you'll have to decide for yourself when you go look at it. Um, the newspaper said that the bases, those are the two square stones down at the bottom, are made out of red westerly. And there seems to be universal agreement on that. But the die, that is the tall part above those two square bases, that's called the die, and the statue uh, were said to have been made from westerly light pink. Well, westerly blue and light pink are very similar. They both have a very fine grain. Uh, the blue is a grayer one, and the pink has a little bit more rosy colored. Um, by judging from everything we looked at, newspaper articles, old scrapbooks, oral histories, and having uh, looked, asked uh, Richard, Brooks. Richard Brooks to come look at it, he thinks it's light pink. Our newspaper sources indicated that it would be light pink. So that's our best guess. And it was to come from the Columbia Granite Company off Old Hopkinton Road. And we thought that was very appropriate that the Columbus statue would come from Columbia Granite Company. Um, it's a marvelous statue and it, it is um, a significant uh, piece of sculpture just by its very size. The process of getting to a statue begins with the sculptor. And the committee hired Charles Pisano, who was an Italian-American who immigrated from Italy in 1905. And he was nationally famous as a sculptor. And he was from Medford, Mass. And you see in the background there a small statue, maybe a foot and a half, two feet tall. That's called a maquette. It's a small plaster model where the sculpture gives form to his ideas on a small scale to try to convince the committee that this is the design that they should go with. Um, and it's, it's a preliminary three-dimensional sketch of the monument, of the statue. In the next slide, we see Pisano next to the full-size uh, plaster model. After the design is approved from the maquette, the sculptor sculpts a clay model at actual size. And after that model is all finished, they make a, a form from it, and then they fill that form with plaster and get a plaster statue. 
the clay statue wouldn't hold up in the environment of the shed. The plaster statue is harder and more permanent. And so that is what the statue cutter will use to cut the uh, statue. And Ellen and I just love the story of John Kaduri. When he was a young boy, oh, five or six years old, and he'd go into the darkened shed, he'd see this white, seven foot tall figure, and it would scare him half to death. So we always chuckle when we see uh, the full size model there, and we hope John won't be too terrified today. The statue carver, that's the man who takes that plaster model and takes a rough piece of stone and somehow with his skill turns that rough piece of stone into the statue that the sculptor had created. And you can see the detail in this. In Columbus's hand, he's carrying a chart. Of course, there were no charts because he was in un charted territory. It was the new world. Um, and under his right hand is a globe, and we'll see that in another slot. But you can see the, the pleats on his, his coat, the, the hair, the detail is incredible on this. This is a very highly detailed uh, statue. It took him eight months to carve the statue and he would use a pointing machine. That's a caliper-like thing that would measure like the distance from his nose to his eye on the model, and then he'd make a mark on the stone so that the nose to the eye would be the same amount on the stone. And it took uh, Charles Gattoni eight months to take the hunk of granite and turn it into this lovely statue. And the fine grain of the westerly granite is very important here because there's a lot of detail. You can see on the lapels of his coat, the detail. And this fine grain granite allows you to do that. There are no big splotches or, <coughs> excuse me, any imperfections. The next slide shows us that not everybody working on this project was an Italian immigrant. Andy Anderson also worked at the Kaduri Company at this time, and he's the man that cut the globe and kept it nice and round. And uh, so there were a contribution by lots of people in the, in the whole uh, organization. We don't know who the letter cutter was. Uh, if any of you do know, call us up and let us know. Um, on the next slide, we can see an example of the lettering on the, whoops, did I miss one? I guess I did. This is the bar relief on the front of the statue. A bar relief is where you make a carving with the stone itself and it, there's no separation. This is a very low relief. It's probably maybe a half inch at most. So to get the details, you need, again, this fine grain of westerly granite. Um, and I hope you can see on your computers that it's uh, Columbus's three ships and uh, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and the ocean waves and the little um, planking on the um, ships. It's really quite lovely. Um, Nick Verzillo cut that. This is the work of the letter cutters. If you know who did it, please let us know. We would love to add it to our records here. But I love the inscription. And for me, after weeks of, of study and searching on this, this inscription tells me how important this statue was to our Italian American community. Cristoforo Colombo, the intrepid Italian explorer who linked the old world of our fathers to the new world of our sons. So it took a while to get everything done on this monument. 
and everything was, the stage was set for Columbus Day, 1949. The original statue was supposed to be dedicated in, on Columbus Day in 1948. And when Linda and I were talking about this, we thought, boy, that contract was awarded in the spring of 1948. How could they possibly have hoped to have it dedicated uh, on Columbus Day in October? But that wasn't the reason that it was 1949. Dr. John Ruisi, who was the chairperson of the committee, fell ill and the committee was, um, so impressed with his work and wanted him to be honored and not to miss this, that they said, we will wait a year until he recovers. The unfortunate thing is, is that he did not recover. And um, his wife was the one who actually unveiled the, the statue. But when we were researching this, we found newspaper article after newspaper article that listed who the invited guests were, but we couldn't find anything that said who actually came. So there was a great deal of bruja about uh, Governor John O. Pastore was invited and Congressman John Fogarty was invited. And then the names just go on and on and on um, about people who were invited. But again, we, we don't really know who came. The original location of Columbus, in case you're struggling to orient yourself here, is between the post office, which is off to the left and not pictured, and the library, um, which is on your right. And originally Columbus was in a small triangle of land, which now does not exist, but um, to the upper, um, to the back of Columbus and to the right is where the Daylily Garden Circle is now. Sam Nardone's company, Put the foundation in for this and that was no small feat you've got to put a, a, a lot of strong foundation in to support a statue and a monument of this size so on that day itself there was a, a whole series of exciting things planned at eight o'clock there was a special mass at the church of the immaculate conception and we know that in 1946 and 1947, there had been um, special masses for Columbus Day and there had been some sort of procession um, following that mass that had something to do with Columbus, but we we're unable to really figure out exactly what that was. At 9.30, the parade began. And I'm sorry about the quality of this picture, but we, we, we can't find pictures of the parade and the dedication ceremony. So again, if you have them somewhere in your grandmother's scrapbook, please let us know. Um, the parade kicked off at the armory. It went down Railroad Avenue and then onto Canal Street and then onto High Street, went up the hill, over, well, over the bridge and then up the hill to West Broad Street School, then turned around and came back down past the town hall, out Grove Avenue, and finally into the, the park. The organizations are all listed in this, on the newspaper articles of the time. And there was everybody, civic, military, fraternal, musical, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, you, you name it. If there was something that existed in the town of Westerly, they were represented in this parade. Uh, on the next slide, we know uh, some newspaper articles said that there were 5,000 people who attended. Other newspaper articles said 10,000 people. And at this time, uh, the 1950 census shows 12,000 people were residents of Westerly. So even if you look at the low end of 5,000 people attending, uh, it was a huge deal. And I think speaks to how important this statue was to the uh, to the whole community. Um, as I mentioned, this was draped in black beforehand and Mrs. Uh, John Ruisi, her name was Renata, unveiled the statue. The master of ceremonies was Joe Gervasini uh, Jr., who was the son of Joseph Gervasini, who had been on the original committee. 
And I have to look at my notes for this next part because I can't do this easily. The original, the main speaker was Judge De Pasquale from Providence. He gave the main address in English. He was followed by a visiting professor from the University of Rome who spoke in Italian. The third speaker was Luigi Scala and his title was Grand Venerable in Rhode Island of the Sons of Italy. And he spoke in both English and Italian. So along with, of course, the town council notables and everybody else that you could um, figure might be invited to speak on, on a, an occasion like this. So, I think, go ahead. Ellen, I think it's so appropriate that the addresses were both in English and Italian for this particular monument. You and I would not have been so good on the Italian, <laughs> but we can appreciate the fact that it was such an important thing to the first or second generation immigrants from uh, Italy. Absolutely, yeah. This next slide shows Columbus in the winter, and we read in one point that he was frequently decorated for Christmas. We don't know whether that meant a Santa Claus hat on top or Christmas lights or what it meant, but it did mean that there was, um, it, and it wasn't done out of foolishness. We didn't get that, that impression. We were done that Columbus was a part of the community and he should share in the Christmas spirit. Um, I like this picture because it shows that slope um, where the comfort station is, and you can kind of orient yourselves to that, um, that place where he was in, in the park. So he stayed there for four decades. But in 1991, the library was beginning to talk about an addition. And they were going to have a shipping entrance on the... Uh, side of the library adjacent to Columbus. And that was going to kind of make it not very formal for Columbus. And then they found that the sewer pipe was going to go dangerously close. So they had to come up with another place for them. And we have a map there that shows the relocation sketch to orient you. It's as if you were looking down from the top of the town hall. And in front of you is the esplanade. To your left is the library. Straight ahead there is the fountain. And Columbus would go over to the right. And that's essentially uh, what took place. Now this moving of Columbus is not an easy thing. Just that first stone, that first base that I showed you on the other slide, weighed three tons. And that's just one little, well, one big stone down at the <laughs> bottom. But the whole thing is very heavy and very big and very fragile. And I mean that because even though it's made out of rock, the details are easily broken. So you can't just pick it up with a steam shovel or something. You've got to know what you're doing, how to take him apart, how to put him back together again. So this was going to cost $12,000. Now, remember that the original statue had cost $14,000. And now we're going to move him in 1995, as it turns out, and it's going to cost $12,000. So that shows you a bit of how prices changed. So David Pensera, who was the uh, director at the library at that point, um, in, uh, in his uh, correspondence, we found that the following fraternal organizations were invited to contribute. The uh, records show that they had special fundraising breakfasts and all kinds of uh, money raising activities in order to fund this um, this move. Bonner Monument uh, Company was the company chosen to actually do the move. And on the extreme left of the group photo is Richard Kaduri, who had been um, the owner of the Joseph Kaduri Company at the time that the statue had been built. And to the right of the two women, is Andy Anderson, who was the man that Linda told you about who carved the globe. 
And we don't want you to be confused. The picture of Don Bonner is just such a great picture of him that we chose him, but he's not holding the globe. That's a part of the statue. He's holding a cannonball that he did to replace one that had been uh, stolen from Gettysburg. So Bonner was the one um, who, who moved that, that statue. We don't have a single picture of the move. So again, if your mother, your father, your grandparents were down there taking pictures of that movement of the statue, please let us know. So in 1995, it moved. There was uh, a little damage done to the surface when it was cleaned with muriatic acid, but uh, you never would know it. You'd have to be a professional to be able to tell. This is uh, when the garden in front of it uh, were, was the daylily collection. You know, it goes back to Emmanuel's vision that he'd be surrounded by flowers. And I think this particular slide really shows that very nicely. Absolutely. So now he faces west towards the library. And we think that this is a fitting tribute. Next slide. In downtown Westerly, click it again. We have Christ Church as one of our landmarks. Granite Church made with two different kinds of granite from Westerly. It's the field or the main part of the wall is made out of blue granite and the trim around the windows and doors is made out of red Westerly granite. The granite was supplied by the Smith Granite Company and I understand that my great grandfather gave them a good deal. <laughs> we should mention that Linda's maiden name is Smith from the Smith Granite Company, so that's appropriate. And then we have the town hall made out of red granite. Some of you might think that it's two different kinds of granite if you look at it closely, but it's just the finish on it. It is a rock face and a hammered finish that makes it look as though it's two different colors and two different kinds of granite. That came from New England granite in 1912, uh, came out of the Batterson Quarry. The balusters on the esplanade there are cut on a stone lathe, just like the wood lathe you probably are familiar with in wood shops. But this is a stone lathe and they're turned that way. They're blue westerly granite and they were produced by the Smith Granite Company. And that's just right next to Columbus. And down just a few steps is the fountain which was cut by the Joseph Kaduri Company. So on this slide alone, you find most of the major granite companies represented and various kinds of granite that came out of the ground in Westerly. And in the middle, as the finest tribute of all, is of course Columbus. And I, we feel very strongly that that's a very appropriate place for him to be. We feel it's a tribute to the granite industry that was the major economic engine for the town for a hundred years. And to the skills of the, the people that worked on it, you just don't pick up a chisel and hammer and cut something like that on day two. It's years of practice and, and honing one's skills. So this is a wonderful tribute to the talented people that we had in Westerly. And I think most important of all, it's a tribute to the community of immigrants who came to this country to find employment and to find opportunities. And it almost makes your heart swell with pride that this is the country that could provide opportunities. Um, and the whole statue is a fitting tribute it reflects the profound Italian-American influence in the town of Westerly. As a high school teacher, Italian was one of the foreign languages taught in this town, where it wasn't taught in very many high schools anywhere. But Italian was part of the heritage of this town. And it's one of the last really big local works produced on a grand scale. So we think he's pretty special. And the more we studied about him, the more we got to know him, the more we enjoyed uh, sharing 
all these things that are so westerly about this uh, particular monument. Got another slide there. So our thanks to Ben Barber, who is the videographer. And we, I might remind you that we're doing this remotely because of COVID. Susan Sullivan Bercato, who is our archivist. Richard Brooks from Buzzy Memorials. Joe Kuduri, who supplied the postcards. Brenda Linton, who is our other archivist. John Linton, who took those fabulous photographs, uh, the close-ups of Columbus. Alan Peck, the Wilcox Park superintendent who helped us um, find materials. Joe Potter, who has chaired the Columbus Day Parade Chair um, forever and ever and ever. And Nina Wright, the reference librarian at the uh, Westerly Library, uh, who provided us with those resources that Linda spoke about earlier. And on the next slide, you see three of us. Well, only two of us are here today. But we really wanted to, to include John Kaduri as one of the authors of this because John has worked with Ellen and me over the last 10 years to, to formalize our study of the granite industry. And he has provided many photos, pictures, and information and encouragement as we all work together to try to document this very important part of Westerly's heritage. So thank you very much. And send in those pictures.